We have been working with recycled plastic for over five years now, and there are some things that we just wish we knew sooner as we would have made the whole process so much easier. So while we're working on today's project, we thought we'd take you through all the things we've learned working with recycled plastic, starting at the very beginning, where we get our plastic from. Let's go for a drive. So when we first started, we were kind of on a mission to save the world and we thought we're just going to accept everything from everybody and that way the most plastic will get recycled and everyone will be happy. But what actually happened was that we actually ended up with just a load of plastic that was super dirty, people weren't listening to the kind of specific types of plastic we needed and our job ended up being basically cleaning plastic every single day. Awesome. So now what we'll do is that we'll still take plastics from anyone that wants to donate it to us, but we're very specific about the types of plastic we'll accept, and that way we don't have to root through a load of stuff that needs loads of cleaning. <laughs> Coffee? <laughs> While we wait for the car to sort itself out, another thing that's really good to do is you can work with specific businesses and they can collect specific types of plastic for you. Like we work with hairdressers for their shampoo bottles, coffee shops for milk bottle tops, um, cleaning companies for their cleaning supplies. And schools are great as well because the kids love getting involved in milk bottle top collections or anything like that. So specific companies, specific types of plastic helps us save lots of plastic in big volumes but reduces our cleaning need. Working now? Just about. I won't turn it off again, I'll tell you that. So now you've got your plastic sources set up, you want to identify the plastic to make sure you're using the right type of plastic to be melting at home. So the perfect plastic you want to be looking out for is HDPE. So that has a number two inside the recycling triangle. And if it has that marking, perfect, you know you're good to go. But that's not always the case. Sometimes it comes without a marking on it, so you need another way to work out what it is. So we've done a whole video guide showing you how to work out a load of different types of plastics. But what we wish we knew when we got started was that if it floats in water, it's polyethylene or polypropylene. And to work out the difference between those two, all you have to do is this. So if it shatters and cracks, then we know it's polypropylene. Don't need that for now. And if it sort of dents and squashes, that's polyethylene. Perfect. So the next step in when you're trying to process your plastic is to get rid of all the stuff that shouldn't be there, like the labels. You don't need to worry about pens and Sharpies. That generally just vaporizes when it's melting. But obviously, if you've got labels on here you need to get rid of them because that's going to mess up your plastic when you're recycling it. Now sometimes labels are made of paper and the paper part of it comes off relatively easy because it doesn't have adhesive all the way around but then you get this adhesive left over which you need to get rid of because that's the bit that can mess up your plastic. And there's various ways you can do this. In the past we've used things like acetone, WD-40 actually works really well if you soak it and let it sit there for a little bit or even vegetable oil but the issue with that is that you're spending ages kind of scratching and it kind of takes a long time. And also, this can be very expensive, particularly the acetone, if you're processing lots of plastic. So one thing that we wish we knew back at the start is that when you've got labels like this, which don't peel off nicely and leave all that horrible sticky residue behind, a really easy way is to use a heat gun to warm up that adhesive and that way it should peel off fairly nicely. Hey, look at that. Still a little bit there. Look at that. Bingo. So now you're going to have all your plastic that's nice and delabeled. The next thing you want to do before you start melting is to make sure it's clean. Ideally, people will send it to you clean, but that's not always the case. So in that scenario, you're going to want to start cleaning it yourself. Now, hand washing is something we still have to do for bottles just to make sure they're properly clean, but we've got thousands and thousands of these lids, and trust me, it's a fairly boring job to sit there and hand wash all of those. So, you want to do this instead. I know! So, much like it helps us with our clothes, the ever helpful washing machine is going to be our best friend for plastics as well. All you need is some of these mesh bags, load it up with your bottle tops, and then chuck it on a wash with a low temperature, fairly quick wash, and that will get rid of pretty much all of the milky, cheesy residue. Lovely. Okay, so you've spent all that time cleaning your plastic. It's all ready, all the labels are off, and you've got the colors separated so you can actually work with it. 
the next job is to start thinking about melting it. And one comment we get all the time is, if we were to melt this plastic, isn't that super dangerous for your health? Uh, and is it gonna create all these fumes and stuff like that? And the truth is, is that HDP is completely safe to work with. We've had a whole video about this. We're never actually burning this plastic. If you were to set this piece of plastic on fire, of course, that's gonna be awful. When we're melting it, we're only melting it to the point where it's molten and not where it starts to burn. You do wanna still be mindful about your cleaning. If your cleaning isn't perfect and you've got adhesive remnants or food residues or anything like that, that could be something that burns and becomes a hazardous thing in the air. So for that reason, I would always recommend keeping your doors wide open. When we first started, we were in this tiny little garage and we had our doors wide open all the time to make sure we had that ventilation. Of course, you could work outside or if you're as lucky as we are, we get to work in this giant space with super high ceilings and doors that can fully open, and that way we don't ever have to worry about fumes. So when we started out, we have always used these panini presses for melting plastic, and for good reason, they are absolutely amazing at doing it. They have heated plates both top and bottom, so they are perfect for the job. But when it came to scaling up a little bit, or when other people come to us saying, how do I do it? we would always say these are the panini presses you need these exact brevels but over time we've kind of learned that you just need to be a bit creative and it's not only this that does the job in other videos we've tried things like churro makers we've done air fryers we use irons for plastic bags basically if it has a settable temperature like an air fryer or an oven we're not setting it higher than 180 degrees celsius and if it's something like a panini press or a churro maker where you have no set temperature we've yet to come across one that goes above the burning point for plastic. Ultimately, it's all about problem solving. If we're trying something new, we're doing it in a controlled way. So trying one bottle top, doing a low temperature, knocking it up a little bit each time. But realistically, it's just being a bit creative, thinking outside the box a little bit and finding something that works. And while we're on the topic, tell you what, we'll give you an extra bonus tip on how to improve those exact problem solving abilities. Brilliant is where you learn by doing with thousands of interactive STEM courses. It's not just about watching someone explain concepts, you get to play with thousands of interactive lessons, which is proven to be six times more effective than just watching lecture videos. We've been using Brilliant to sharpen our critical thinking skills through problem solving and not just memorizing. So it's helping us to not only build real knowledge on specific topics, but it's actually allowing us to become better thinkers. We've been enjoying courses that focus on maths, data, and AI that we're able to implement to help us solve real problems in our workshop. So if you want to see what Brilliant is all about, then head on over to brilliant.org slash brothersmake to try it out for free for 30 days. Then if you love it as much as we do, you'll get 20% off an annual subscription. Thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Let's crack on with melting some plastic. So a question that we get a lot is why do you only focus on milk bowl tops? And there's a really good reason for this is because they actually melt differently. Even though it's still HDP, it's all got the number two in the triangle, it's still different. There are different grades of HDP within that kind of categorization of number two. As a bit of a visual demonstration for this, in this panini press, we've put some blue bottle tops. And in this video press, these are like cleaning bottles, all got the number two, but this will show you how different the two different plastics are. So, oh, so annoying, it's right on the edge. Look up at a light, turn around, that one behind you. It's gone. <laughs> it's gonna happen right in the middle of a bit, isn't it? So here's a <laughs> Okay, so in this video press, we've got the bottles and you can see, if I peel this off, this is a proper slab, it ain't going anywhere. Even if I kind of pull it, it kind of stretches back to its original shape. You can stretch it out, but it's definitely got a lot of resistance. This feels like chewing gum you've been chewing for a bit too long, that kind of texture of it. Whereas on the other hand, on this panini press is just bottle tops, and you should be able to see the difference. Now generally, these are much looser, much easier to work with. You can already see that that's kind of dropping by itself, just under its own weight, whereas the other one would never have done that. There you go. <laughs> it's like a little slug, isn't it? Something would've been very helpful to know when we were first starting out is that not all HDP is the same. So this is why we like using bottle tops, especially for beginner stuff. This does work, but you have to be a little bit clever with it. You can take something like these snips, 
and you can kind of chop them up into little bits and then disperse them throughout something with better flowing plastic and that will help. Here's an example. This is our colour called Tropical Whirlpool, which is one of our most popular colours that we use for our products on our website. And this is a really nice turquoise colour. You can see here that the blue and the green all comes from these really nice flowing bottle tops and the white is what comes from these bottles. And in this ratio, I'd say maybe a third of it is probably the white bottles. In that ratio, it flows absolutely fine. If I was to do a colour solely with bottles like this only, I would have a really tough time working with that and getting that to fill a mould. Right, it's a big tip this one, Matt. Do you know what it is? What is it? It's trying to reduce the amount of air bubbles in your plastic. As soon as you're working with plastic, you are going to very quickly realise that your biggest enemy is air bubbles. If you go back to one of our first ever videos when we worked with recycled plastic, that beginner's guide, you'll see straight away we made a pen, we made a lovely blank, air bubble, the whole thing blew up. So there's a couple of things that you can do to reduce the risk of air bubbles going into your piece. So to get around air bubbles, you're going to want to do a series of twists and folds to get the air out of the plastic. Now, a lot of people are probably thinking right now, oh, when you're making candy and making rock, that's exactly how you introduce air into it. It's not the same with plastic. Well, it might be on a microscopic level, but the bubbles we're talking about are much bigger. Give us an audio. So the bubbles we're talking about are, are bigger, and if they're in your final piece, we'll make an air gap, and as soon as you're cutting into that, they'll ruin the look of the overall product. They just look rubbish. So what we're doing, is sort of twisting it, folding it over and squishing it down then putting it back on the heat. The only issue with the twisting and folding is that you can start to lose some of the really nice vibrant colours as you blend them more and more. So what we do now to get around that is we melt our plastic in separate colours, do all the twisting and folding. At the end we can combine all the colours together, just do a little bit of twisting and folding and that way you still get to keep all those really nice marbled pattern. This is that tougher, gummier plastic we were talking about earlier, so slightly harder to work with, but it's still fine. Blue eggs. Little blue eggs. Do you know what's another little sweet bonus tip, Matt? Mm. If anyone signs up to our Patreon, <laughs> then they can get access to our plastic knowledge filled DMs. They just shoot us a message. We're always chatting to our patrons or we have our, our regular hangouts on Zoom. We chat about recycling tips and stuff like that. So I don't know, that's just a, another random tip for you. you. Don't have to listen to it. 12 tips. <laughs> Someone's going to ask, these are Teflon baking sheets. These are silicon oven mitts. Every single video. We should say it in every video because it's the most common question we get. Get something heavy. Oh no. So when your plastic is ready to go into the mold, the most important thing you can do is make sure that the pressure is as high as you can and as consistent as you can because plastic does two things. It shrinks as it cools, but then it also wants to do lots of funny stuff and go all warpy and wobbly. And if you don't add enough pressure and it comes out the next day, it's just gonna look gross and ugly. So fairly early on in our plastic recycling journey, we built this guy. This guy is a bottle jack press, and the idea is that you press him down, the plates squish together, and it adds really nice consistent pressure. It would have been nice if we'd have built this a little bit earlier, because that would have helped. You can obviously use clamps, you can use a vise, you can use anything you've got your hands on, but this just allows you to be super quick, and it allows you to get the mold in and get pressure on really, really speedily. And the other thing is that plastic takes a long time to cool down. So you need to keep adding the pressure for a lot longer than you would normally think. What we typically do is we come in and then for the next hour or so, we will keep adding this pressure. And then every five or 10 minutes or so, we'll come back and we'll just, you'll feel it, that this will have backed off a little bit or the plastic will have shrunk a little bit. We'll come in and just add a little bit more and that way we'll keep the plastic nice and flat. In this scenario, we've actually got 
metal mold plates to help keep it nice and flat. But same thing goes, if we just back the pressure off, it would still go all wobbly and not very nice if we didn't add the pressure. Now the last step is going to be finishing off your new little plastic creation. And when we first started out, we always sanded everything, thinking that was the only way to get a perfect finish. But since then, we've actually realized that there's a load of ways to do this without making loads of tiny little bits of plastic waste. So now as a rule in our workshop, we don't sand any plastic because even if you have got really good dust collection, you're still gonna be creating a load of microplastics. Instead, we're opting for techniques that make much bigger bits of plastic waste. So knives, deburring tools, thickness of planers are great for bigger slabs of plastic or if not a cheap option is something like a card scraper, which works perfectly. If you're just looking to get into DIY plastic recycling as a bit of a hobby, or to use up some plastic waste that you have lying around, then those tips will absolutely see you through, and trust me, you're gonna be 10 times better than we were when we got started plastic recycling. You, maybe. <laughs> but if you're looking to potentially make some money or even turn this into a business, then our last tip would be around pricing. This is another question we hear all the time, and the tip we would give you is don't undervalue how much time it takes to make these products because yes, the material is free, and a lot of people will say, oh, the product's gonna be really cheap then, isn't it? That's not the case, because you've taken the time to collect the plastic, to sort the plastic, shred it. Whatever you're doing, this whole process takes time, and your time is worth money. It would actually be a lot cheaper to do this with virgin material compared to recycled. So there's a story there, and you should build that into your products about how you're working with plastics and taking material from the environment and reducing pollution around you. And whichever way you're doing it, if you're doing it in a DIY method with panini presses and little molds, or if you're using machinery like we have and you've vested in something in order to make products that are repeatable and wholesaleable to larger markets, it really doesn't matter. The process of how to price things is still the same. Work out how much money you're prepared to work for in one day, and then work out how many products you can produce in that day. And dividing one by the other will give you the price of the product and how much you should sell that for. And all of that should encompass the whole process from cleaning the plastic all the way to finishing it up and packaging it. And don't forget to include the cost of packaging strips and anything you're gonna include when you send your product or somebody buys it from you. Any more tips for the viewers, John? Um, don't dress the same on the day you're doing a video. <laughs> We're the Salmon Brothers today. <laughs> well, hopefully you've finished this video feeling a bit more knowledgeable than when you started. And feel free to go and watch some of our other videos if you want to see other examples of things we've made from recycled plastic using either very DIY methods or other methods that we've got in our workshop. We've got a whole playlist which is called DIY plastic products or something like that. And that is all products that you can make just using this very simple method we've been through today. So that should give you some ideas. Go make some money. Do it, make us proud. We'll take 5%. <laughs>